The War Against Women by Marilyn French. Introduction In the popular view of human history, humans have progressed from a state of savagery in which we live like predatory animals and men dragged women into caves by their hair, to a civilization in which men open car doors for women. But the reality may be the reverse. Evidence suggests that for three and a half million years, humans lived in small cooperative communities in which the sexes were equal, but women had somewhat higher status and more respect than men. Archaeological remains from about 10,000 years ago reflect goddess worship in communities living in egalitarian harmony and material well-being. War may have begun about 10,000 years ago, but not until the 4th millennium BCE did men begin to build what became patriarchy, male supremacy backed by force, probably first in the Middle East. Men began to assert themselves as big men, appropriating the labor and resources of others. Over thousands of years, gods superseded goddesses as king priests began to rule over formerly autonomous communities and spread domination over the globe. After the rise of the state, peasants, the main producers in agricultural societies, bore the major tax burden. Their labor on the land supported parasitical elites and they were drafted to work without pay on state projects. They even had to pay for the instruments of their own repression, soldiers and weapons. For women, it has been downhill ever since. Women were probably the first slaves and while elite women had considerable power in early states, they were subject to men of their class. Women, did not only, women not only did not progress, but have been increasingly disempowered, degraded, and subjugated. This tendency accelerated over the last four centuries when men, mainly in the West, exploded in a frenzy of domination, trying to expand and tighten their control of nature and those associated with nature, people of color and women. European men had built ships capable of circumnavigating the globe for at least a century before they began to use them for that purpose in the late 15th century. Their explorations, motivated by curiosity, mixed with greed for wealth and fame, generated some of the most tragic chapters in human history. By force and subversion, Europeans exploited Africa, Asia, the Middle East, the South Pacific, and the Americas, killing, enslaving, or subjugating their people and appropriating their resources. In the next century, men reached out intellectually too defying church restrictions to create the beginnings of an experimental science, justifying their efforts by biblical sanction of human domination, domi dominion over nature. Their work provided a basis for a new technology they thought would benefit the human race, which eventually produced the Industrial Revolution. Industrialization did bring benefits, especially to a small group, but it also propelled most humans into new depths of destitution and misery. As feudalism gradually ended and capitalism began, a property to lead in England thrust huge numbers of peasants off the land and locked them out of any share of society's goods. The Industrial Revolution began in England partly because of the existence of this class, which Marx later called the proletariat. 
For varied reasons, people were displaced from land throughout Europe, joining the proletariat, a faceless mass of dispossessed people, the majority of whom were women and children. Those who benefited from capitalist industrialization became a new elite, a fluid, dynamic class. Individuals might rise or fall in wealth or power. What was constant was that the elite was composed almost entirely of white males. The women attached to them may have benefited from their wealth, but did not share their power. By the 19th century, most humans across the globe were workers or indigent subject to a small elite, and almost all women were subjugated to men. By then, unremitting male effort over centuries had succeeded in thrusting women's position to its nadir. Women possessed almost no human rights to a political voice to inherit, to own property, to do business on their own. They even lacked rights over their own bodies. But subjugation generates resentment and the last two centuries have been dominated by revolutions. Workers and women's rights movements inundated Europe and the United States like a tidal wave in the 19th and early 20th centuries, inspiring nationalist rebellions in Asia and Africa in the mid 20th. Workers protested the unfair division of the world's resources, exploitative systems, granting the people who produce goods little share of them. Most resources were and are owned by a small elite whose economic control gives them political power. The workers' movements were largely inspired by socialist ideas widespread in the 19th century. The first socialist experiments, the Owenite communities of early 19th century England, were concerned with women's lot. But early European socialism was dominated by artisans' guilds, concerned above all with protecting their own prerogatives. By the time Marxism came to dominate socialist thinking, <coughs> few socialists cared about the problem women bear alone, responsibility for child rearing and maintaining the family while working to support their families, alone or with a husband's help. Economic hardship and lack of political voice drove women to rise up in the 19th century. Middle class women through feminism, working class women through labor agitation rooted in anarchist, socialist, or communist principles. Since for a woman even to speak in public violated gender rules, these women were making a feminist statement even if they disavowed feminism. Socialism had wide ranging consequences in the 20th century. In some states, socialist revolutions overthrew autocratic governments to set up dictatorships of the proletariat. In other places, fear of socialism led the elite to support repressive autocratic, autocratic rulers who seized power and benefited the military and wealthy interests. In so-called democratic states, fearful elites assimilated workers' demands and legalized unions to negotiate them. Socialist states removed legal discrimination against women, but made no effort to teach men they must share the responsibility for taking care of themselves and their homes or raising the next generation. Fascist governments tried to solve the women problem by reimposing extreme male controls on women and constricting them within the domestic realm. Capitalist governments and male-dominated labor unions colluded in keeping women in the lowest paid, most marginal work. Everywhere, women were denied the right to work for decent pay on grounds that men supported them. Since not all men did, women and their children were thrust into even deeper impoverishment, and men who did support women treated them like property. Feminist ideas have, had been articulated for centuries by writers like Christine de Pisan Mary Wollstonecraft, George Sand, and a host of others, and a feminist move movement arose during the French Revolution. But feminism as a widespread political movement dates to 1848, and the Seneca Falls movement in the United States. Smaller and more fragmented than workers' movements, feminism was even more threatening. It distressed all men, not just the elite, by creating discord at home. And unlike workers' protests, 
by challenging men where they were most vulnerable in their self-definition. In this century, feminism has achieved striking successes in gaining women access to education, political rights, and jobs, and in eliminating laws enforcing a double standard, mainly in industrialized and socialist states. Feminism has so many forms that many scholars refer to feminisms. I define as feminist any attempt to improve the lot of any group of women through female solidarity and a female perspective. Considering the power and solidarity of the forces arrayed against them, feminist success in improving women's lot in so brief a time is dazzling. Elite men kept seeking ways to defeat organized labor, moving their factories to regions and later countries where labor was not organized. Forming transnational corporations, they built factories in countries without protective laws where they could also buy cheap raw materials. Corporations huge enough to control governments, some of which, notably in England and the United States, tried to wreck unions, set out to bring labor to its knees. After World War II in the United States, wages and working conditions improved for blue-collar men, whose average earnings leapt from $15,056 in 1955 to 24000 $621 in 1973, but by 1987, their average wage adjusted for inflation was $19,000, $19,859, a 19% decline. By the 1980s, many married women had entered the workforce to raise family income, but in 1988, two salaries brought in only 6% more than one in 1973. Business policies are gradually eradicating well-paid jobs protected by union contracts. As one economist puts it, one well-paid smokestack job with health insurance has been replaced by two service jobs without benefits. The capitalist elite wanted to defeat labor and especially socialism, but ironically, socialism was defeated by the very government supposed to enshrine it socialist elites as oppressive and exploitative as those they displaced, even more so embattled as they were from outside. The late 20th century has witnessed what seems the final deceit for our age of workers' movements. As socialist governments fall, socialism itself seems discredited. Still, workers go on struggling. The labor movement is not destroyed. If it catches up with the new strategies of a global economy, we can expect to see continued conflict. In the same vein, men as a caste, elite and working class men, continue to seek ways to defeat feminism by resenting or gnawing away at its victories, legal abortion, confining women to lower employment levels, putting a glass ceiling over professional women, or founding movements aimed at returning them to fully subordinate status. Fundamentalism. As kin group and community controls erode, men everywhere increasingly fail to support the children they engender and use violence against females, daughters, wives, lovers, mothers, sisters, and strangers. Men are adapting new technologies to old purposes, for example, using amniocentesis to detect a fetus's sex to abort girls or new fertility techniques to create children that cl they claim as their own, surrogate motherhood. These actions amount to a global war against women. This war is aimed at reasserting or tightening men's control over female bodies, especially sexual and reproductive capacities and women's labor. Although not all women are or want to be mothers, most women are mothers, and only women are mothers. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Marilyn. Mothering means taking responsibility, and since the beginning of human life, women have taken responsibility for the well-being of the human race. This is their choice. They do it not because they are programmed to by genes or hormones, but because it is necessary. Hormones. One has only to glance at a newborn baby to understand 
the necessity. Besides, women have always done it. It is customary. But as industrialization, ideas of equality and freedom, and technology make it possible for women to repudiate this often thankless task, more and more women are doing so. Seeing this, men panic. Knowing that someone must fulfill this role or the race will perish, they face several alternatives. They will have to take on this role, unbearable. They will have to reward women for what they do, unpleasant. Or they can use every means at their disposal to urge, demand, and force women to continue in their role and their subordination. Most men choose the last, although they have not considered its costs. Just as men war against other nations without considering long-term consequences, they persecute women without recognizing they are destroying the human race. Men want to make sure that women go on taking all responsibility for producing and rearing children and caring for them economically and personally. This statement may nettle men who do not support, who do support their families economically, but the reality is that huge numbers of men in both industrialized and non-industrialized countries do not. No statement in this book is directed against any individual man. It is based on global information and is an indictment of a system invented and maintained by men as a caste. has hyphens. Men as a cast. Uh. Okay. I believe patriarchy began and spread as a war against women. At first humans did not recognize the male part in procreation. Yeah and men were marginal in community life. Women did everything, as they still do in, most, in many societies. They bore and reared the children, gathered and raised most of the food, and probably had the major voice in group decisions. Humans probably lived this way for two million years until they invented projectiles and hunting began. <laughs> While early people hunted as a group, men gradually took control of hunting. They may have been better at it, having more upper body strength, and they were expendable in a way that women, the life givers, were not. Hunting gave men a role in society and a base for solidarity. Even after people realized that men fathered children, that recognition is suggested by artwork in Anatolian villages dating to 9,000 to 700 BCE. Social arrangements remained the same. Evidence and common sense suggest the following hypothesis. Several enormous changes occurred. People, probably women, began to raise crops instead of gathering them, which enabled the population to grow. As an increased population spread out across the world, the supply of game dwindled. Hunting became undependable. Men's single known ground of importance began to fade. To regain their status, they created hunting cults, excluding women, whom they may have blamed for the lack of game, still believing all life flowed from the female and gradually began to worship male deities. All hunting societies have exclusively male hunting cults. But boys who grew up not as hunters but farmers lacked the old male solidarity. Men imitating the onset of puberty in the female devised puberty rituals for boys to teach them male solidarity. With the exception of certain Australian ar Aboriginal groups, Gathering hunting people do not hold group initiations of boys. Most group initiations occur among horticulturalists. Male solidarity came under threat when gathering gave way to horticulture. 
it, it then had to be contrived or it would have vanished as each man worked his plot alone to keep it alive men began to initiate boys into maleness because the only ground of male solidarity is opposition to women and because its aim is to replace the primary bond to the mother with whom men associate life-affirming qualities like nutritiveness, compassion, softness, and love. Building male solidarity always involves some form of brutalization. Male initiations teach boys to have contempt for, to eradicate feminine traits, replacing them with hardness, self-denial, not self-sacrifice obedience and deference to superior males it creates a bond different from love an instrument for a higher good a transcendent goal power many puberty rites specifically require boys to reject their mothers and with them the female world she actually has a lot of scare quotes that i haven't been doing women as a caste it has hyphens. Oh, come on. And have never defined themselves in opposition to men and lacked female solidarity, forming their main bond with their children and knowing themselves absolutely essential to the life of the group. They may not have been threatened by male solidarity they may even have encouraged rights they believed would increase their son's well-being and man's sense of responsibility. But probably under the direction of male priests, avid for power, once men discovered their vital role in procreation, they began to insist that children carry their name and form patrilineages. In order to ensure a male line of descent, in some places, like Africa, men enslaved women, capturing them and separating them from their own lineages to which they owed obligations and who communally owned their children. Even so, to claim parentage, a man had to guard the woman's sexuality. Men began to demand a wife move to her husband's clan at marriage, isolating her from kin placing her under the surveillance and control of her husband's lineage. Only at this point did men start to abuse women. These steps were taken at different times in different places, but had spread almost everywhere by about 5,000 years ago. Women fought these changes. Myth and legend preserved in the Bible and other ancient works testify to a struggle between the sexes over the centuries. But women's defeat was also a defeat for men who lost the relative autonomy and equality of kin group life. The Sumerian word for freedom, amargi, means back to the mother. Zeal! That crazy! The idea of domination caught the imagination of certain men who, to impose their rule over larger regions, introduced innovations large-scale war, tribute, taxation, bondage, prostitution, and two new crimes, treason and adultery. While women were soldiers in many societies, fighting gradually became a predominantly male activity, probably for the same reason hunting did. Conquerors forced defeated peoples into bondage, taxed them and sometimes appropriated their land. The state was born. Women had high rank in early states, but only as they were related by blood or marriage to the male ruling class, and usually as men's subordinates. All early states decreed in law that women's bodies, their sexuality and reproductive capacity, were men's property and made it difficult or impossible for women to own or transfer property. Patriarchy, that is, institutionalized male supremacy, probably arose in Mesopotamia in the 4th millennium BCE and gradually spread across the world. <coughs> uh, 
Many revolutions have challenged ruling elites since patriarchy arose, but feminism is the first ever to challenge patriarchy per se. In virtually every country in the world today, women are organizing small grassroots or professional political action groups. They are demanding to be treated as human beings with rights, the right to keep their own wages, to keep their children after divorce, to own property, to education, to paid work at a wage sufficient to ensure that they can live independently, to a voice in public decisions, to marriage at choice, to bodily integrity. They are demanding men not feel free to beat, rape, mutilate, and kill them. Feminist theorists challenge the patriarchal arrangement of society into stratified classes, each with different access to resources, some privileged, some disadvantaged from birth, and patriarchy's worship of domination. Women are central in global peace and ecology movements. Women form female networks and organizations based in cooperation and sharing, the only pro-tem leaders. Women are creating an alternative definition of themselves, human nature, and experience. Men imbued with patriarchal values are mustering all their forces to defeat this challenge. The social and political movements of the last two centuries were based on enlightenment ideas that justified the revolutions that brought present elites to power. For that reason, elites cannot repudiate these principles and sophisticated men cannot openly admit they believe peasants, workers, and women are inferior species ordained by nature to serve them. While some people still use such arguments privately, the idea of natural inferiority is not legitimate in late 20th century Western discourse. But patriarchy never announced its real purposes at least, no such announcement is recorded in history, although myths of many cultures celebrate or justify a male assault on female dominance. Literally this. Wherever and however men subjugate, subjugated women, they justified it by declaring God or nature made women subordinate to men, by endowing men, but not women, with certain traits reason, logic, intellect, souls, and women, but not men, with traits, chaotic emotionality, unbridled sexuality, subversive of good and proper order. Men treat women as marginal to the real business of life, not the essential maintainers they are. Even when feminists force men to hear them, politicians treat them as a special interest group, as if their concerns affected a small fraction of the population, not all women, 51% of the population in most countries, and the children for whom women take almost sole responsibility. Today, when governments or religious leaders articulate policies extremely injurious to women, they rarely mention women directly, focusing on other issues and cloaking them in euphemisms. The euphemisms usually used to promote female subordination is protection of the family. This is ironic. After all, which sex has always maintained the family and taken responsibility for children? But many men in groups with political clout or as individuals with guns or fists need no euphemistic sanction to injure women. As a result, in much of the world, women and children Women and the children always with them have become an endangered species. Charlotte Bunch writes that if one ethnic or national group were attacking another, killing and maiming them at the same rate as men attack and kill women, and she is speaking only of attacks by intimates, the situation would be held to constitute a state of emergency or even war. But domestic violence is only one campaign in what amounts to a widespread war against women. Because men mask their intention by omitting women or granting them superficial inclusion, we have to demystify their aims by looking at effects, not rhetoric. 
it may be objected that effects may be accidental or incidental or occur without animus. But it cannot be an accident that everywhere on the globe, one sex harms the other so massively that one questions the sanity of those waging the campaign. Can a species survive when half of it systematically preys on the other? Humans are the only species in which one sex consistently preys upon the other. Men claim male predation is natural, rooted in genetic or hormo hormonal coding, and therefore unalterable. Men are by nature driven to abuse and dominate women. If this is true, humanity is doomed to extinction. But history suggests men did not always prey upon women, that the sexes once lived in relative equality. Patriarchy may have evolved to overcome female dominance, but if women were dominant, they never institutionalized that dominance in matriarchy. No matriarchy has existed that we know of. Never tried to constrict male sexuality and reproduction, minds and work. In historic periods when women had considerable power, there have been some, they never united against men, nor is it conceivable they would. Men's need to dominate women may be based in their own sense of marginality or emptiness. We do not know its root, and men are making no effort to discover it. But men's long-standing war against women is now, in reaction to women's movements across the world, taking on a new ferocity, new urgency, and new veneers. The essay that follows is divided into four parts. Part one deals with system, systemic wars against women, ways women are disadvantaged by overarching international and religious systems which individuals cannot change. These disadvantages ramify differently in different countries, but there are some universals. Everywhere in the world, Men place all or most of the burden of raising children and maintaining the home on women, but pretend this burden is not work. They do not reward it as work or count it as work in global accounting in either developing or industrialized countries. Systemic economic disadvantaging of women inevitably creates systemic political discrimination. Women overburdened by work lack leisure to pursue political activities and those who do not face systemic barriers. As a result, the women of the world have little voice in running the world, which perpetuates men's power to subject them economically. To keep women out of political life, men refuse to credit their con contributions to it and obliterate them from history. We will discuss one recent example of this long-standing and widespread problem. Religions are major vehicles for subjugating women. To keep women from having political power, power within churches, a voice on public issues, religions concentrate mainly on women's bodies, treating the female body as if it incarnated the morality of the entire human race. Thus some focus on women's appearance, dress, and habits as if all human virtue depended upon them yet men's appearance, dress, and habits are seen as irrelevant to virtue. Others focus on women's potential for motherhood, as if women alone had the duty to perpetuate the human species. Religions do not require men to support or reward or help women in this task, but they demand that men control it. The discussions of religious war against women moves on to state efforts to dominate women by passing laws governing female bodies, either in alliance with a religion or independently of it. Tied to religion and to the notion that women bear the burden of human sexual morals is a practice promoted under the aegis of many religions, genital mutilation of women, which an estimated 20 million women in the world today have undergone. Finally, we will discuss war against the very existence of women in parts of the world that selectively abort female fetuses, turn a blind eye to female infanticide, or neglect female children to the point of starvation. Part two deals with institutional discrimination, focusing mainly on the United States. Here too, the effort is across the board. Institutions try to keep women from economic self-sufficiency, a political voice, and control of their bodies. Institutions sometimes try to justify this treatment of women, and the section opens by discussing one current scientific justification 
sociobiology. It moves to some recent examples of prejudice against women in various professions. The medical profession in general is unconcerned with women's medical problems. Many doctors try to control female reproduction or take pleasure in mutilating women's bodies. The legal profession injures women in myriad ways, treating female lawyers contemptuously, making biased divorce or custody judgments. In education and business, males are given preference. Only occasionally and with difficulty can individuals challenge the bias of these institutions. Part 3 offers some examples of women hatred in culture, in language and the arts. Cultural product products are disseminated by institutions and may even be created by them. But culture is too amorphous to be attributed to any given institution. Culture is built from form, style, and image. Its surface may mask its politics, just as rhetoric masks the politics of governments, religions, and businesses. But uncovering, demystifying its politics requires a somewhat different kind of analysis. For this reason, I have assigned it a section to itself. It includes discussion of the language of high-ranking men in the military and the weapons industry and of soldiers' songs, the policies of advertisers in women's magazines, and random observations on male depictions of women in the arts. It concludes with a discussion of male sadomasochism against women in the arts and some thoughts on the issue of censorship. Part 4 discusses assaults on women's bodies in daily and domestic life. The media treat male assaults on women like rape, beating, and murders of wives and female lovers or male incest with children as individual aberrations. But they are so widespread as to be systemic. Male violence against women could not flourish as it does without the support or at least toleration of institutions like the courts and police. And psychological studies show the preponderance of men who rape or commit incest to be within the range of what is considered normal for men in American society. Thus, the violent acts of individual men are intrinsic parts of the cultural context. Indeed, in many countries of the world, men still have a legal right to beat, torture, imprison, or kill the women they own, and elsewhere, men had such legal prerogatives right up until the 20th century. Governments, religions, institutions, and cultural groups that do not openly condone male violence toward women countenance it as a private act outside their provenance. The pretense that this violence is not protected by institutional ages means that humane groups like Amnesty International, for example, cannot intervene to protect women from beatings. Mu imprisonment, mutilation, torture, starvation, rape, and murder within the home, unless these acts are explicitly allowed by law. Indeed, many men, even within humane movements, refuse to acknowledge that the issue of human rights includes women. Moreover, statistics are not kept on male predation on women in general. Each category of crime is separate, obscuring the fact that all male violence toward women is part of a concerted campaign. I, have, I do not have the resources or knowledge to analyze the relation between individual male violence toward women and children and governmental, religious, and institutional policies in any given country, so I did not include this area in the sections on systemic or institutional war on women. And I want to stress the vital importance of ordinary men in waging male war against women. If individual violence could not be as widespread and devastating without broad scale support, neither could global wars against women continue without the support of individual men. Only feminists and analysts treat male violence toward women as a global crisis. By treating violence toward women as individual acts, journalists, social scientists, and social workers conceal the politics underlying it. 
they whitewash men and in the process preclude public discussion of the real situation. Yet without public discussion, we cannot plumb the reverberations on the male psyche of feeling permitted to abuse women in ways few would abuse animals, nor seriously discuss human morality. Any discussion of the repression of women is complicated by several factors. The circularity of women's problems, the difficulty of proving discrimination, and men's obsession with female reproduction. The circularity of women's problems. Any instance of discrimination in property rights, say, affects not just a woman's economic power, but her political voice, her body, and her children. If a system grants property rights almost exclusively to men, as many African countries do, a woman to survive must either marry or, and farm her husband's land or find work in a city. Most African women are pushed into marriage, but marriage brings children and many African men do not support their families. If a man's land is insufficient to support them, or if her husband divorces her, a woman must seek work in a city, but she has the children. They may bear their father's name, but he takes little or no responsibility for them. Having children makes it harder for the woman to move from place to place in search of work. She cannot simply leave them alone. And by rule or custom in Africa, few women are educated enough to do office work. Like, okay, like, this is, like, from the 80s, I think. Oh, 1992. So, we don't know, like, okay. Um, an impoverished woman with children can find work only in a marginal occupation. Domestic service, petty trade, or prostitution. Women are hired as domestic servants in a few African countries. Female domestic servants are often sexually appropriated by the men of the house. Petty trade is often illegal, as is prostitution. Since patriarchy began, prostitution is the only work for which men pay women enough to support themselves. But she still may not be able to earn enough to survive, or she may fall ill. If she does, her children starve. If they fall ill, she has to tend to them, which means she cannot work, and they starve. Society blames her for both her work and her children's condition. She grieves and blames herself. This is a common scenario. Economic factors affect women's bodies. Family law is primarily aimed at controlling women, women's not men's bodies, but also affects women economically in negative ways. And whenever women are harmed, so are children. The circularity of women's problems is reflected in this text where one subject regularly spills over into others. It is sometimes as impossible to distinguish a particular injury as to separate those who are inflicting it, male-dominated governments, churches, corporations, and institutions. I want to stress, though, that almost always when women are harmed, children are harmed. And when women are helped, children are helped. Thus, policies damaging to women essentially damage the entire human race. The difficulty of proving discrimination. It is hard to prove discrimination in societies pervaded by prejudice. It is always possible to find something to attack if you look for it in any human being. Anyone determined to find another person or group inferior can always find whole lists on grounds that demonstrate inferiority because we are all inferior to the ideals of humane, humanness we have erected. If we set out for a change to prove men inferior, we could cite the fact that men die at a greater rate than women in every decade of life, that they are emotionally stunted, unable to provide emotional support, cannot have babies or raise them, or even make their own dinners. 
subject to hormonal swings that cause them to flare into rages that threaten life, their own and other people's. They're also fascinated by toys, particularly adept at inventing structures that give them the illusion that they are in control. They have certain redeeming features, they are sexually passionate, and their irresponsibility frees them to be playful or brilliant about matters unconnected to the real business of life. Surely such a species should be set in a playpen to amuse itself while we <laughs> take the burden of responsibility for managing society, raising children, and cooking dinner. If this were the prevailing ideology, individuals, individual acts that challenge the definition could be fit into it, and protests by male groups would be seen as resulting from hormonally caused mood swings. Whites see black men in white neighborhoods or expensive shops as predators. Whites see black women in rich white neighborhoods as maids or nannies, but as prostitutes on city streets and shoplifters in expensive shops. In Moscow, women cannot enter hotels without proof they are guests because the government assumes that any non-resident woman entering a hotel is a prostitute. This may have changed since my last visit in 1990. Mad anecdotal over here, Marilyn. Some anecdotal shit. It's all good, though. When I was young, good restaurants would not seat a woman unescorted by a man. Women without men were seen as prostitutes. This is prejudice. Prejudgment of people based on their inherent unchangeable sex or color. It may be overt, or it may exist on a level beneath consciousness among people's assumptions. All societies entertain prejudices which do not need to be spoken to be shared. Thus, they are hard to prove. Many societies encode their prejudices and their laws. The feminist movement has brilliantly succeeded in removing discriminatory laws from the codes of most industrialized nations but men now use more sophisticated techniques to exclude women. Few make sweeping statements of female inferiority, but many continue to act as if only men mattered. Company men insist no discrimination was involved when a certain woman was not promoted. The problem was the guys didn't like her, she didn't fit in. The operative word when people disparage women is to. Women's voices are too loud or too soft. They are too aggressive or too passive. Dressed too doughtily or too gaudily. Are too old or too young. Every human traits, trait annoys someone. In women-hating societies, everyone finds women more annoying than men. Women are seen as deviant, whatever they do. A recent book, The Trapped Woman, Catch-22 in Deviance and Control demonstrates the Catch-22 situation trapping women. One article lists some characteristics that mark a woman as deviant. Not having children or having children, working for wages and using childcare, or having children working for wages and not finding childcare. Women who have children and need welfare aid to support them are found guilty as are women who divorce, who are battered and do not fight back, or who leave their batterers or fight back. Women are castigated for being sexually free, or for being uptight about sex, for clinging to virginity, or for having extramarital lovers, for being raped. Women are deviant if they are assertive, or if they are meek and subservient, if they do not devote themselves utterly to their husbands and children, or if they selflessly sacrifice themselves to them. Society condemns women for being ambitious or for lacking ambition, for being rich or poor, fat or thin, with careers or without them. In all patriarchal cultures, women hatred is common currency, the small change lying in every man's and many women's pocket, easy to pull out to pay for, justify any action. Because women are blamed for being whatever they are, discrimination is difficult to prove. We must study its effects to prove its existence. <clears throat> Men's obsession with female reproduction. Men too are oppressed everywhere by racial, religious, economic, and political factors. 
women share these problems equally, except that of male identity. A serious problem few men ever really face. But men do not share most of women's problems. The root of the problems men do not share with them is women's reproductive capacity. Women's situation would be unique even without patriarchy because the human race is recreated through their bodies. But the patriarchal system locks women in their bodies. Because women bear children, men try to control or appropriate their bodies. The male-dominated system takes the position that women do indeed, as was thought for millions of years, reproduce all by themselves, miraculously. The attitude that women alone produce children pervades all societies and all levels of mentality. From the simplest to the most sophisticated. <coughs> Since women alone bear children, men assign them alone the responsibility for raising children. Men claim ownership of children, demanding they bear their names, but act as if women alone chose to have children and so have the exclusive duty of raising and often supporting them. Because women bear children, their problems are always circular. What men do to women's bodies often affects their childbearing, and motherhood has an enormous and enduring impact on a woman's life, on a woman's entire life. No treatment of a man's body, including castration and fatherhood, burdens him equally for the rest of his life. He does not bear children for whom he will be responsible for decades. Men can therefore compartmentalize their experience in a way women cannot. Because women bear children, men persist in seeing all women as mothers, owing them caretaking service. Yes, God? Exclusive responsibility for reproducing and socializing the human race might conceivably be bearable if women were given the power to achieve those goals. But men expect women to perform the most important of all human tasks with no reward, without much help, and with almost no consideration. History suggests that men envy women's reproductive capacity. It was the first female power they tried to appropriate, turning women into commodities to, for exchange and use even before states began and their efforts to control it remain nothing short of obsessive. In the following discussion, efforts to control women's reproduction crop up repeatedly. It will quickly become apparent that the drive to control female reproduction is a silent agenda in every level of male activity. This book is a survey. It is not exhaustive. Global statistics on male violence against women Battery, rape, incest are either not available or not reliable. We have yet to discover the dimensions of incest. The treatment of women in courts of law, the arts and media, and in customs and habits is barely touched here. But what is here should alert you to look for yourself. Oh my god. Oh my god. That was so long. Okay. The end. The end of the introduction.